Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our Global Transfer Pricing Industry webcast series today. Today's webcast will be on the industry insights and the impact of COVID-19 on the banking and capital markets, asset management, and real estate sectors. <coughs> Today's speakers are um, Jobs Wimmann from uh, Germany, introducing our global industry program, who is heading this program. Rajiv Shah from Deloitte Consulting US, who will set the scene by sharing some very interesting insights on the financial services industries. We will then start off with the polling question and then hand over to our speaker, Stephen Weston from the UK, Ralf Heusner from uh, Luxembourg, Bill Johanna from the US, Wilke Emig from uh, Germany, Priscilla Rattila from the UK, and Piero Bonarelli from Italy. Before I, I hand over to the speakers, uh, please note that this session will be recorded and shared with you within the next days. Enjoy the webcast and Jobst, over to you now. And Audrey, thank you. And Audrey, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, also from my uh, side. My name is Jobst Wilmans and I'm heading, respectively coordinating uh, the Deloitte the Transfer Pricing Global Industry Program. Uh, for your information, we started uh, with a program two years ago and the objectives are to link um, the industry knowledge with our TP expertise and, uh, on, uh, and also to be um, um, one step before, uh, before the tax authorities. As you know, um, more and more uh, tax authorities are more and more organized also in industry, especially competent authorities. And from our perspective, it is uh, or the, it is absolutely of importance yeah, that we are linking uh, industry-specific uh, expertise with transpricing uh, expertise. Um, the global transpricing um, the global transpricing network um, in, uh, is organized uh, like a cube with three dimension. Um, here, our goal is uh, to liaise uh, all three dimensions with respect to the needs of a market. And that means uh, that we are organized on one hand in industries, as you can see uh, today. Secondly, we are organized in product and services. Yeah? So, for example, economic analysis, value chain alignment, the financial transactions, and so on. And the third uh, dimension are regions. And uh, from our perspective, it is absolutely of importance, uh, of importance to link all three uh, dimensions. To go to the next slide, um, here you can see our organizational setup. Uh, in the next uh, one minute, I would like to give you an overview about um, the organizational structure, structure in the financial services industry. Um, the financial services industry in transfer pricing is uh, headed by Samuel Gordon, located in Japan. Um, the financial services industry is um, clustered in three sectors. Uh, first of all, banking capital markets. Um, uh, this sector is headed by Stephen West, uh, Weston, who is located in the UK. Um, the second sector is uh, the insurance sector, uh, which is headed by Sebastian Ormail also located in UK, and the third um, sector is investment management, um, uh, headed by Ralf Holzner, located in Luxembourg, and the fourth uh, sector is real estate, headed by Bill Jana, located in New York in the US. What you can see also on this slide is that uh, each sector is organized on a regional basis, uh, for, for the time being, yeah, I am not introducing all the se uh, regional sector leaders, but if you have any question, if you have any need, yeah, feel free to contact uh, one of these uh, leaders. At this point, um, first of all, I wish you a really very interesting session, and uh, now I would like to hand over to Rechef, you know, Rechef uh, from our U.S. practice uh, in New York. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where you are. Um, this is Rajiv Shah. Um, I'm part of the strategy practice um, within financial services here at Deloitte. I'm based in the U.S., but have spent in my previous life a good part of my consulting career um, in uh, London and as well as in Hong Kong. 
Um, I'm going to cover, uh, set the scene as the agenda says, uh, go through a few uh, 10 macro forces that we are seeing emerge or um, trends. And this is uh, based on a combination of uh, two things. We have been conducting over the last several months uh, ongoing, if you will, a set of research interviews and so on. And uh, of course, in the last few months, uh, a lot of our work with clients across the segments, across the industries, um, has highlighted some of these some of these trends. First, the first macro trend that we are seeing emerge is this evolution of remote operating models, um, and um, these are uh, clearly accelerating uh, and will drive both we think benefits for employers and employees, but also stresses for both sets of parties. Clearly, there are some obvious benefits in terms of uh, diversity of workforce that you can bring in, but there are for, for employees, but uh, clearly there are also some stresses about demarcation of time and space and so on. And from a company perspective, you know, culture, training, and all those issues will create stresses. The second linked uh, force uh, or trend is around stability and infrastructure modernization. We believe that um, initiatives will accelerate and enhance uh, in these areas. Initiatives to accelerate and enhance these uh, resiliency issues will take hold. And of course, um, given this remote models, breaking the inertia of digital adoption is also going to be a big force. Um, there is a clear hypothesis here that uh, muscle memory has changed over time, will change over time, and that uh, from a customer point of view, digital adoption will take hold. And, and also from an employee perspective, that we will be able to drive more, um, more digital, more remote uh, operating uh, procedures and models. Now, all these, uh, all these will clearly take, uh, you know, consume investment. And so I, we believe that financial services uh, institutions will take this opportunity to implement cost reduction, cost compression initiatives. And uh, these might become bolder as time goes on, depending on the severity of uh, impact on their uh, P&L and balance sheets. We also think and we are also seeing banks' investment horizons and focus coming into uh, a sharp um, uh, purview. Uh, we think investments in uh, – there is a barbell of investments taking place. If there are regulatory commitments at one end of the barbell, then they, those will continue. On the other end of the barbell, banks are really and, – and institutions are really focusing on um, uh, making sure that the investments that they are making have really clear returns, are very focused on revenue or cost or resiliency issues. And anything in the middle, which, is, which was a nice to have maybe six months ago, a year ago, is getting much more, uh, scru much heavily scrutinized. Um, credit, credit risk appetite clearly is going to be uh, reevaluated. And um, we are seeing that even now in the larger lenders. Um, and it really does mean that some of the governmental institutions will have to step in where there are stresses and strains in the system. Um, so that's the that's the supply side. On the demand side, households and corporate capacity um, to take on financial risk will also come under focus. And we believe that in some instances, this is going to get dampened down, which will have a commensurate impact on the P&L and balance sheets. Um, and collaboration that has that we have seen between banks and governments, we believe will continue. Um, as um, uh, as we safely reopen the economies, and uh, there will be new ways in which this this collaboration will evolve. Right now, we see that in the U.S. and in parts of Europe, of course, banks have become the conduits where governments have passed on um, uh, for governments to uh, release credit. But this collaboration will clearly evolve as time goes on. Um, and, and given the close collaboration, the close wor working relationships, we also believe that new forms of supervision conduct will also come into play. And finally, we believe that societal role of, of financial institutions will also come into focus. And we are seeing that even right now uh, in terms of what institutions are, are doing. 
you know, you see banks foregoing or delaying um, repayments in some instances and so on and so forth. And I think banks are clearly taking a much more uh, active role in, in issues around diversity, inclusion, race, and so on. And I think that we think that will continue as well. So those are the 10 macro forces that we believe will shape um, the next six months, several years out. Clearly, the rate of adoption always varies by each of these forces. But once, we, once the adoption takes hold, um, we believe it will accelerate. Um, I will now hand back to Anudri. Anudri. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Raj. Um, yeah, so be before um, the next speaker will be sharing their views, uh, we'll start off with the, with the polling question. Um, so, so the polling question is, um, what immediate COVID-19 related tax tax issues is your firm facing? Um, you can choose one of the answers. Um, and the first answer is tax implications of re relocated staff and remote working, or impact on existing transfer pricing models with respect to loss situations and availability of comparable data. Okay, wow, well, we see some results already. Um, uncertainty linked to insufficient guidance from tax authorities, OECD considerations for subsidize and relief, or tax administrative relief with respect to disputes, audits, and APAs, or don't know, not applicable. So we'll just give everyone a minute um, to choose their answers. Okay. Seems to be that the impact on existing transfer pricing models with respect to law situations and availability of comparable data seems to be the most um, challenging um, situation here for, for, for the firms. And um, our speakers will, will um, touch upon that as well. And, and the leading and equally tax implications of re relocated staff and remote working, I think we're all um, facing that as well. Um, secondly, um, uncertainty linked to insufficient guidance from tax authorities. And last, okay, don't know, not applicable. Okay, thank you uh, very much, everyone. Um, Stephen, I will hand over to you now to start off the presentation. Thanks, Anodri. Yeah, so Stephen Weston here. I'm an FS transfer pricing partner based in London. Uh, in this uh, ECM Insight card, I'll be joined by Zilka, my uh, colleague from our German office. First of all, I uh, wanted to pick up on a couple of the themes that Rajiv mentioned. So to set the scene in terms of the banking sector, obviously the re-regulation that followed the 2008 global financial crisis put banks uh, in good stead entering into the pan pandemic. In contrast, uh, households and companies entered the crisis relatively highly leveraged and therefore more susceptible to economic shock. As we know, banks have been called upon by uh, governments to support uh, funding, uh, be that actual loans or standby facilities uh, across the economy. And with uh, corporates and household indebtedness likely to rise further, uh, as Rajiv mentioned, the, the risk to banks uh, of either credit misallocation, credit losses, or even possibly to solvency uh, will obviously be uh, an issue. On top of that, as we know, central banks have continued to aggressively cut interest rates, uh, even beyond uh, previous historic lows, uh, which has put additional pressure on uh, bank interest margins. Uh, I think all these factors obviously will weigh heavily on the banking sector, and we're looking potentially at the situation of losses across the industry. Zilka, I'll just hand over to you to kind of pick that theme up, please. Sure. Thanks, Stephen. We'll get to the implications for funds transfer pricing later on in this presentation. And I'd like to focus on another area for transfer pricing specialists in the banking and capital markets sector right now, and that is losses. The potential for losses exists across lending, trading, and investment banking businesses, and banks have already begun booking significant loss provisions. For lending businesses, 
it will be fundamentally important to review the current analysis undertaken to determine the branch that the loan asset should be attributed to under the AOA. In particular, consider if the location of active credit management is aligned with the existing current location once the management of a loan portfolio has been centralized in a workout or intensive care unit, for example, at the head office level. Likewise, for trading businesses, the key questions are, what is the default position in your transfer pricing agreements regarding losses? And does it make sense given the current unprecedented credit and market volatility? For example, does the location bearing losses have the economic control with respect to the functions performed? If losses sit with a capital provider, is that the same location as where the traders are located? Lastly, make sure you have a good view of your anticipated potential losses early. Significant adjustments, particularly close to or after year end, are much more likely to draw attention of tax authorities. And with that, I hand back to you, Stephen. Thanks, Zilka. Just to, to round out um, a summary on the BCM inside cards, and just a couple of other points. Uh, again, Rajiv touched on these. So, firstly, as we know, uh, there's been a dramatic shift to remote working, uh, and I think that's highlighted the continued need for investment in IT systems, as well as um, the, the push to uh, ramp up technology offerings to customers in this sector. Um, likewise, you know, we've seen a lot of um, publicity and certain bank CEOs come out and question the future of their, uh, their real estate footprint, uh, given these factors. So I think playing all those into transfer pricing, I think over time uh, we may see an impact in terms of what we view as the traditional um, value driving functions within the sector currently. And how, if anything, do we need to flex those or think about them further, given the kind of rise of uh, fintech? Finally, um, as we've we've talked about um, on on the slide, so typical transfer pricing models, uh, particularly in the banking sector, can often include um, a cost plus floor for sales branches uh, to reward them uh, as, a, as a kind of minimum. I think a couple of things, I suppose, in, in the context of uh, the, the COVID environment and the wider the potential for wider losses. Uh, first of all, you know, is that plus uh, fit for purpose going forward? Do we need to revisit that uh, given the, the COVID situation? And then secondly, uh, just generally in terms of that policy, you know, is, is that uh, also does that also need revisiting given where we are with COVID? And, and you know, does, does anybody really get a guaranteed return? Um, that's really wrapped up the COVID summary of the, of the BCM. I'll now hand over to Ralph to cover investment management. Thank you, Stephen and Silke. Appreciate it. This is Ralph Hosner here, financial services tax partner based um, with Deloitte in Luxembourg. And I'll be covering the investment um, managing part um, and if we look towards the overall sector, both across the traditional and the alternative sector, of course, the investment managers are facing challenges on a number of fronts. And these challenges affect both regulated as well as unregulated funds, both at the fund level as well as the investment level. So the sector obviously has witnessed the combined impact of large outflows of assets as investors were focusing on liquidity as well as lower asset valuations that are eroding the magnitude of management fees. And in addition, lower asset valuations are also reducing the level of performance fees, if they are any charged, which have also become an important source of income for traditional funds. We have also seen, um, if you look towards newspapers, that certain funds have been facing difficulties in meeting investor redemptions. So obviously, one of the initial responses was focused on compliance with regulatory requirements and avoiding a liquidity crunch for the funds, or respectively the management companies, the MAMCOs, or the alternative investment fund managers, or IFMs, how we call them, that are managing such funds. And um, 
It's also worthwhile noting that financial regulators were already focused on fund liquidity in the investment management sector prior to the COVID-19 outbreak. And given those new risks and developments, the management of liquidity has become even more important for the investment management sector. Um, if we look towards alternative funds, and of course, Will afterwards will talk in more detail around the real estate sector, the, the COVID-19 pandemic is, of course, impacting the quality of underlying investment assets. If we look across private equity, real estate, and um, the debt side, and of course, triggering questions around the underlying financing arrangements that are inherently linked to the quality of the assets that are being financed. Overall, what we can observe is that the focus is now shifting to assessing the potential impact of this new normal on existing transfer pricing models. And of course, in the investment management sector, how to remunerate the key functions across the value chain that cover the, the MANCO, the IFM as the regulated um, manager, the fund administrator, portfolio manager, and the capital raising or distribution function. And um, Stephen already mentioned, we have the same situation also on the investment management side. The key question is really for transfer pricing purposes is how to deal under those existing transfer pricing models with either implied loss situations. So as an example, if we have um, fee share arrangements that are insufficient to cover the cost of local distribution operations, for example, or actual loss splits, if we look more towards profit split models, um, in the alternative sector that maybe now turn even into a loss split model. So the strong recommendation also here would be to monitor the effective profit or loss distribution across the group by combining what we call the existing price setting approaches also with outcome testing approaches to really get a good view on, on the actual results and, and corroborate the, the existing models. Um, the practical challenge will of course arise how to treat potential loss situations, especially for regulated entities. And here we're looking towards MANCOs and, and the IFMs, um, but also especially to group internal service providers where there are potential flaws, meaning minimum compensation clauses, or we might see certain support payments or liquidity injections being triggered to stabilize the profit liquidity or capital positions of those entities. And um, as already picked up by, by Stephen before, the same applies um, for the US management sector. There, there is continuous issue around the potential creation of new permanent establishments through remote working as we are coming out of the lockdown, but still facing limitations. Um, impact on, on substance, of course, if we look towards your board meetings or shareholder meetings, but also to functions such as investment committees if they have to be conducted only on a virtual basis. And um, last but not least, one of the trends that we will see even more emphasized is that we will see um, an increased focus of regulators on transfer pricing in the asset management sector as an indicator of proper management of those regulated structures, especially given how centralized those models have become with funds, for example, domiciled in, in Ireland or Luxembourg, managed out of those jurisdictions and then being distributed or managed out of um, a variety of, of other jurisdictions. This is all um, for the brief wrap up on the investment management side. Um, so uh, financial transactions, um, as we know, uh, that's now enshrined in new chapter 10 of the OECD transfer pricing guidelines. Uh, and covers kind of long-awaited final guidance on, on financial transactions. The number of topics uh, that are discussed within that guidance, um, today we're really going to focus primarily on how we apply the guidance in the context of financial services, in particular in the banking sector, where the regulatory overlay and general complexity uh, gives rise to some interesting questions. Just like the, the, the original 2017 guidelines uh, within the financial transactions uh, section, there's also recognition of the uh, underlying um, interpretation uh, with respect to the regulatory overlay. So um, 
we're going to walk through that in terms of the, the, the different aspects of that and how that feeds in uh, in context of the guidance and the particular topics within the guidance. I'm going to be joined by uh, my colleagues uh, Zilke uh, from, from our German practices, Piero from Italy and uh, Chris from our UK team. All three of them uh, have uh, experience uh, in-house, so it'd be also useful to get their, their insights having seen both sides. Uh, Piero will cover uh, implicit support and the Treasury function. Uh, Zilke is going to discuss the lender-borrower perspectives, liquidity and funds transfer pricing. But first, I'm going to hand over to um, Chris, who will share her thoughts on delineation, uh, in particular, bearing in mind the regulatory constraints, as we discussed. Chris. Thanks very much, Stephen. The new OECD guidance on financial transactions requires accurate delineation of such transactions. And this is really consistent with the post beps focus for all intercompany transactions, as outlined in Chapter 1 of the 2017 OECD Transfer Pricing Guidelines. However, the new financial transactions guidance in the all-important um, paragraph 10.15 clearly acknowledges that regulatory constraints play a key role in determining the contractual terms of financial transactions. The OECD specifically highlights Basel requirements as an example of regulatory constraints which could impact the conduct of the parties as well as the terms of the financial transactions. The characterization of loan assets or funding liabilities as short-term or long-term, for example, could impact the calculation of a bank's net stable funding ratio or the NSFR, which is a liquidity requirement introduced as part of the Basel III Accord. So, for example, a rolling intercompany deposit may be categorized and priced as a short-term asset, as it has to be readily available to the holder and is treated as such from a regulatory perspective, notwithstanding that the deposit may be maintained and in place with its intra-group affiliate over a long period of time. Recharacterizing such a transaction from a tax perspective to a short-term asset will have implications not only in tax and transfer pricing, but also from a financial and regulatory perspective. Therefore, having regard to the actual conduct of the parties as set out in paragraph 10.22 of the new guidance, does need to be balanced against the written terms of the contract, as well as the consequential regulatory impact. The Basel Committee on Banking Supervision requires global systematically important banks or GSIPs, for example, to ensure that they have sufficient loss absorbing and recapitalization capacity if they fail in order to minimize the impact on financial stability, ensure the continuity of critical functions and also avoid exposing public funds. This has resulted in GSIPs needing to enter into financing arrangements that qualify as MREL or TLAC debt instruments, commonly known as bail-in debt or loss-absorbing capacity debt. A number of the characteristics of such MREL and TLAC debt will govern the pricing analysis and characteristics such as um, long tenors, subordination, lack of security and the ability to be converted into equity are all based on certain minimum regulatory requirements in relation to such debt to qualify for the particular capital treatment that they receive under the relevant regulations. The OECD guidance states that in an ideal scenario, a comparability analysis would enable the identification of financial transactions between independent parties, which, mess, which match the tested transaction or the intercompany transaction in all respects. However, it is important to note that many intra-group financial transactions within the banking sector, for example, do not have a precise analog in the open market, precisely for the regulatory reasons highlighted above. Benchmarking analyses for MREL or TLAC debt instruments, for example, may require adjustments or additional analysis for non-standard features and may have limited comparable data as they are generally not similar to financial transactions issued by non-banks. Therefore, it is important to be very aware of regulatory constraints and their impact on the terms and conditions of intra-group financial transactions when thinking about the pricing. I will now hand over to Zilka to discuss borrower and lender perspectives on intra-group funding. 
Many thanks, Pris. One of the key messages of the new OECD guidance is that the transfer pricing analysis for financial transactions should reflect the options realistically available to both parties. In a nutshell, while the lenders will generally consider the optimal use of their funds, the borrowers want to optimize their weighted average cost of capital and to have the right funding available to meet both short-term needs and long-term objectives. In the banking sector, the options realistically available to the borrower depend on the funding sources that they can tap into. While universal banks often have access to deposits, as well as wholesale funding and bonds or similar capital market instruments, pure investment in wholesale banks are generally limited to the capital markets. Also, the options realistically available to intergroup lenders in the banking sector for the use of the funds are generally the same as those of the borrowers in the same banking group. In principle, the lender could engage in corporate lending or trading transactions if they had the required expertise, client base and infrastructure to do so. However, if these are not readily available in, or in place or not sufficient to absorb the funding, trading um, or lending outside the group would not be realistic in the short term and the alternative options available to the lender therefore much more limited. Once the borrower's and lender's perspectives and options have been analyzed, the next question is the transfer pricing approach to the intergroup lending. Depending on the facts and circumstances, the cut method may be applied and arm's length interest rates be based on bond issuances, for example. Market data on bond issuances is readily available and can be filtered for currency, term, credit rating of the issuer or other factors to derive bond yields as an indication of the arm's length rate for interest rates for intragroup lending transactions. Alternatively, the cost of funds approach may also be applied in accordance with the OECD guidance. Particularly in the banking sector, the cost of funds approach may also be of relevance as a second method to cross-check the results of the cut method. This is due to the regulatory focus on cost of liquidity in this sector. In recent years, banking supervisors around the globe have issued requirements and guidance to ensure that banks appropriately reflect the costs, benefits and risk of liquidity in their funds transfer pricing, or FTP for short. First and foremost, FTP is a strategic management tool that enables banks to establish a cost structure for internal funding based on the external funding profile of the bank. The FTP process allocates the funding cost to products and business lines that require the funding based on their risk and maturity profile to allow for adequate product pricing and profitability measurement. In that context, the source of funds and funding mix of the lender need to be considered. Customer deposits represent relatively less expensive source of funding to banks when interest rates are at normal levels. An intragroup lender that has access to customer deposits as a source of debt funding in addition to secured wholesale funding and capital markets issuances therefore may have lower cost of debt funding overall. That would generally also be reflected in the banking group's FTP framework and therefore a key consideration for the arm's length pricing within the group as well. The bank's FTP framework should therefore be reviewed as part of any tax transfer pricing analysis of intragroup lending transactions. In summary, the new OECD guidance on financial transactions and the reference to regulatory requirements are a good opportunity to catch up with the Treasury colleagues. And with that, I hand over to Piero for some insights on implicit support in the context of financial transactions. Thank you, Silke. Thank you. Well, among the issues addressed by the new OCD guidance, implicit support is a key element. 
As defined by the OECD, implicit support is the incidental benefit that a multinational enterprise is assumed to receive merely by virtue of group affiliation. It reflects the likelihood for a given enterprise to receive financial support from its parent company or even from any other associated entity, regardless of a legal obligation to provide said financial support. So even in the absence of a financial guarantee arrangement. And the OECD guidance clearly states that implicit support shall be taken into consideration when evaluating the credit risk profile of a borrower, with obvious implications in the determination of interest rate. Indeed, the impact of implicit support may vary depending on several different factors, but we may say in broad terms that the higher is the strategic relevance of an entity, the higher is the likelihood that this entity will receive financial support from other group members, which is also the approach adopted by independent rating agencies. If we look then at implicit support in the financial sector, we might expect that the implicit support impact is rather strong. We should consider in particular that the ultimate parent of a financial services group is generally required by the regulators to ensure, among other things, that subsidiaries are sufficiently capitalized and have access to liquidity in order to meet their financial obligations to creditors. And rating agencies would very likely take into account these regulatory requirements which entail a group support of subsidiaries. Moreover, reputation. Reputation has a high relevance in the financial services sector. So allowing any subsidiary to become insolvent could well trigger a group-wide insolvency. According to the European Banking Federation, which submitted some comments to USCD during the process of public consultation of the first draft release of the USCD guidance, well, according to the EBF, banking groups generally will not wish to avoid reputational damage and may not be allowed under regulatory requirements to let their banking subsidiaries go bankrupt, which implies that banking subsidiaries will generally be able to rely on their banking parents' capital and liquidity support. However, the issue of implicit support is not always so straightforward in the financial services sector. There might well be some restrictions from a regulatory perspective on the actual ability to support other group members. If we consider, for instance, the recovery and resolution plans that global systemically imported banks need to implement, those plans recalled previously by PRIS, these plans could significantly influence the relationship between parent and subsidiaries. For instance, by introducing reinforcing measures or by forcing the adoption of a given intergroup funding approach and also by imposing a particular path to insolvency. So this is definitely a point of attention. With reference to credit rating, the OECD guidance assumes that the parent has a higher credit rating than the subsidiary, in a way that, under this framework, the subsidiary enjoys a credit rating enhancement by virtue of implicit support. Instead, in the banking sector, subsidiary banks might also have better credit ratings than the non-operating holding company. This might be due, for instance, to the fact that banks are closer to the financial assets being created or to the negative impact of country risk in the jurisdictions where the holding is located. So this is also something which needs to be carefully looked at. One very final comment on the treasury function. As acknowledged by the USCD guidance, depending on the business model of the group and on the complexity of its operations, this function can take sometimes very different forms from highly centralized to more decentralized structures. Indeed, in the banking sector, 
the organization of the treasury function may be subject to specific regulatory requirements and tends to be more complex. Treasury departments of a banking group are primarily responsible for raising external borrowing and making it available to business units. In most cases, the Treasury Department manages a variety of different types of risks. In some other cases, Treasury undertakes less complex functions, such as merely centralizing funding raised by group entities which have access to deposits and passing these funds on. This is to say that Treasury operating models vary widely from one group to another, and it is of crucial importance that a detailed functional and risk analysis is carried out before concluding on the appropriate transfer pricing methodology to remunerate this function. Stephen, uh, I hand over to you now for some conclusive remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Piero. Um, so my colleagues have touched on the impact for banks of the financial transactions guidance. Just to pick out a couple of impacts across different sectors within FS. So I think insurance uh, probably echoed the points that Piero made in terms of the, the potential um, mismatch there to, this, to the typical scenario in terms of looking at the, the, the group ratings. So in insurance as well, you're likely to see that the OPCO uh, may have a better credit rating than the whole code uh, when doing your analysis. Um, the other points, just picking up on uh, something Ralph touched on in terms of the real estate fund sector. So obviously leverage is typical in, in that sector when you're looking at propcos uh, who are established to, to acquire properties. So again, drawing out the accurate delineation of the related party debt in respect to those propcos and then picking an appropriate pro approach to pricing uh, the loans, uh, assuming that they're characterized as loans, um, will be important to factor in the, the revised guidance. So just to conclude, um, firstly, thanks to Zilka, Pris and Piero for their, for, for their valuable insights. Uh, I think finalization of the, of the financial transactions guidance has been very useful. Um, I think absent that guidance, um, uh, around implicit supports that was in the uh, OECD guidelines already. There, was, there wasn't anything formally documented or concluded by the OECD in this area, so that's very helpful. I think broadly it's fair to say that uh, there were not many big surprises. So a lot of, uh, most of the things that are talked about in the guidance uh, are, are things that practitioners have looked to follow uh, generally in practice previously. I think the final guidance on credit rating analysis, uh, I think is certainly an improvement on the, on the previous draft. It does give uh, room for maneuver in approaches. Uh, although we are seeing a lot more activity from tax authorities in terms of defaulting to the group rates, group rating uh, interest rates, uh, when they're looking at intercompany financing across kind of multinationals generally. Uh, we've obviously seen the new legislation in Germany, and uh, I think that's really a space we need to watch in terms of different tax authority approaches along that curve of, of credit ratings. I think also the role of the Treasury function, as, as Piero mentioned, and how we, how we reward that uh, routine or otherwise is likely to come more under the spotlight. Obviously, in a, in a banking situation, the complexities and you know multiple volumes of transactions makes that slightly uh, more interesting and complex analysis. And then I think in terms of the point that Piero mentioned about Treasury raising funds and passing it on within a group, I think there you are going to see more um, spotlight on the inherent conflicts that, that may create, where the the the, the, the entity that's raising the funds has a as a lesser credit rating than, say, the recipient entity. You know, how do you square the circle on that between um, the, the price that the recipient entity pays versus uh, the uh, raiser of the funds generating some kind of margin? I think finally, just to round out on this, so uh, I think all this shows that a reassessment of financial transactions to take account of all the new guidance and the points therein around, for example, delineation or 
uh, making sure we understand all the economically relevant characteristics will be will be important and a fresh analysis and a documented fresh analysis uh, will will be needed so I think Anandri, back to you um, I suggest we, we go to the q a part um, so we did have some um, questions submitted to us before we um, you know before, when, when the when our clients registered um, I know we had several questions but um, Stephen, um, I've, do, do you want to start answering some, some of these and um, address them? Yeah, I think there was a couple around the, the cost plus floor and, um, you know, that, that model going forward. And, and if you've got that model currently or you don't have that model currently and, and you're transitioning to uh, one or the other, um, you know, what, what what's the approach of... Um, What's the kind of risks of that, and you know, what, what, are, what are our thoughts? I think Ralph, you wanted to kick off with a couple of thoughts on that. Thanks, Stephen. And, and I would probably first and foremost mention that anything around cost plus floors, uh, floors or um, support payments, of course, needs to have a link to the existing transfer pricing policy and intercompany agreement. So we need to have a legal basis for that. But I would say that probably in addition, the most two valuable um, aspects might be to, to really align that with the regulatory position. So what has been submitted or approved by the regulators or what we're currently seeing from the regulators as their view on how certain entities in that value chain um, should in the end behave. And I will maybe just make the, the link um, to what we're seeing from different European regulators where we're seeing certain views coming in. Um, especially, again, around regulated um, entities that need to maintain a certain amount of um, capital as well as liquidity. So that might always be a good good driver for the argumentation. In the, and the other one is, of course, comparable data. And as an example, if we look towards um, third-party Mencos or IFAMs, so the management companies in there, but also other service providers, there, there is data that we can find in agreements, for example, and also stipulate certain minimum fees. So I think linking that to the existing transfer pricing policy, linking to the regulators, linking it to the comparable data, I think that would be um, the necessary ties that you have that you have to make um, to also support a potential switch. Yeah, I think just to add to that, Ralph, I think this definitely could be an area of uh, potential double tax, I think, and uh, tax authority disputes. So if you're looking at it's quite common, I think, if you look at models where you've got sales branches, as we said, to have these cost plus floors. And I think tax authorities are therefore used to companies filing returns with where that floor is triggered, which it often is triggered with kind of guarantee, you know, 10, 15 percent margins. So if, if you're transitioning it away from that, then you've got the risk probably on the, the side of the, the sales branch territory. Um, Likewise, if you're transitioning to that model, you might have the risk more at the hub level um, in terms of the tax authority. So it's, it is a definitely delicate, delicate situation, as you said. If you can point to the regulatory overlay and or um, comparable agreements, then that, that, will, that will definitely help. And of course, document in the end appropriately. Yeah. yeah. Contemporaneously, especially. Yes, I think um, documentation will be, be key um, during this um, phase in, in order to, to illustrate the, the thoughts um, and uh, the, the evidence behind any changes that are made. It is um, a little bit like open heart surgery um, because we, um, we, we're still in, in, in the middle um, of this um, COVID crisis um, and no one um, neither um, governments nor management boards um, nor other markets participants have, have a, a real sense um, of how far into the crisis we really are. Um, so it's essential that any um, transfer pricing consequences that are being taken are well documented in order, order to reflect the logic uh, behind any changes that, that are being made. I think another another point that was drawn out in in Ralph's uh, commentary on the investment management um, section, which equally applies, as he said, ac across sectors, 
was the point around you know corporate tax PEs uh, in the age of remote working. You know, if that, if that carries on into the future, um, that will definitely require uh, more analysis. I know currently tax authorities have, have broadly been quite lenient and relaxed their, their typical rules in this space. Um, but, but you know, if we go forward and that model is maintained in some way, shape, or form, then uh, I, I, I suspect that tax authorities will, will, will not be as relaxed as, as we go forward. Um, and I think generally we've seen, certainly in the UK, there was a pause on inquiries um, from kind of March time when, when COVID really started to hit. Um, but um, we've just seen those kickstarts again now. So I think, I think obviously tax authorities will need to pay for all this COVID funding in some way, shape or form. So they'll, they'll be looking to these areas, I think. I don't know. Ralph, if you've got any thoughts on that. On that one, definitely. I mean, probably with some delay, but you're absolutely right that we will um, see increased attention on, on, on that point, both, I would say, by tax authorities as well as by regulators of that, considering how closely integrated those, those two areas is. And another thought just to add on that, um, in addition, of course, to the PE and home working dimension and, and, and substance aspects, we, of course, also have the, and I think, Stephen, you mentioned that, around what we see, how the way of how we work is going to change. So there will be further investments, of course, in the IT digitalization, how we interact with customers, especially in the sector, sales and distribution channels, and so on, that will, I think, be further intensified um, by, by this development. So I think here also the question is to, to keep in mind um, how to actually structure those investments, where to invest, who should invest? Should it be um, cost contribution or cost sharing arrangement, or should there maybe go going forward some form of IT license fee? I think those are all now um, um, a catalyst that we are seeing in the current environment, where those considerations are becoming even more, even more important. And Audrey, do you want to open it up for a couple of questions? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Thank. Thank you. So I will. Um, the audience is actually on um, unmute, so you can um, actually speak to us and um, ask the, the the speakers for for any questions or if you have any comments, um, you can speak now. Okay, I, I think there are no more um, questions at this point. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, attending today's uh, webcast and, and listening to our, our speakers. Did you have any questions you want to address or discuss with any of our presenters today? You may reach out to them at any time. Um, and uh, we look forward to um, maybe seeing you on our other next industry webcast um, soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye.